Hello everyone, welcome back to the Little Lang Gang. Today we are going to be talking about bayonet charge with our department expert who looks incredibly uncomfortable to be here, <laughs> Mr Grimmett. Hello. <laughs> are you happy to be Sorry here? Sorry for me. I, I am, yeah. <laughs> I am, for the record, I am happy. I'm very, very happy. <laughs> Thrilled to hear it. And, of course, giggling away in the corner yeah. is Miss Goff. Hello. Hi. I'm not going to say much again. No, no, you sit there being thoroughly helpful. <laughs> 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 to be fair, you are helpful. Just it's now become tradition to start the podcast with an insult yeah. at your expense. Yeah, anything you want to say, Mr Grimmett? You've really put me on the spot because we already agreed that I didn't have anything. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, you're rubbish, can't do anything. Next, <laughs> move along. Oh, professional start. Yeah. Now I'm un- now I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> right. The okay. mega mind behind it. The mega mind. It's a real honour to have you yeah. here. Yeah, I, would, yeah. I should have thought so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so bayonet charge. We, as always, we'll start with the context. So we can presume bayonet charge is set during World War One. Interestingly, mm. it doesn't actually state it's World War One, but we can presume it is based on the language yeah. that they use. The there's, title. Yeah, there's reference to a king there as well. Yeah. We can assume. I think it's George. Someone or other who was king at the time, George Second, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, so there, there is relevant reference to that, but I think he's designed that in such a way that that can be attributed to any any war, really. Mm. But we know that bayonets were kind of used in in World War One, yeah. um, a kind of gun with a a knife attached to the edge, mm-hmm. which would have meant um, that they would soldiers would have been expected to deal with very close combat. Literally stabbing people with their mm-hmm. with their with their guns, um, yeah. Yeah, he's he's unnamed as well. It, it is that universal he of a soldier in a war, both unnamed, therefore can extend to anyone, anyone, mm. anyone at all. Absolutely, so it's universal. I think really. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And of course, Ted Hughes himself. I mean, I personally find him. I've spent years hating him because I'm a big fan of his wife, Sylvia yeah. Pitt. Mm. Deceased wife. So he, they, they were, they were married uh, for quite some time, and they, after their separation, was it a year later? She killed she, herself. Yeah, she, she herself was troubled, wasn't she? She tried to kill herself in her twenties. Met him. They yeah. had a very like passionate relationship, but very turbulent. Yeah. And he, she ends up, she did kill herself. Mm. Weirdly enough, do you know his second wife did as well? Uh, yeah. So he married Asia Weevil after. It's not a great track record, is it? No. The same way. So Sylvia oven. Plath killed herself with the oven, and so did Asia Weevil, and she, Asia Weevil killed it's their like child. Stuck inside of an oven, oh. which you could. Is that right? Yeah. Something. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. yeah. Essentially, gassed herself. Uh, but, and then Asia Weevil did that as well, killed herself in the same way, and Hughes and her's four-year-old daughter. Wow. So and then sorry, the the child killed herself as well. No, 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 no. Sorry, no. But hang on. This no, is where I get a bad teacher asking <laughs> questions that I'm not sure. Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath had two children, mm. Nick and Frida. Yes. Frida's still alive today. Nick killed himself. Yes. His ex-wife Sylvia Plath killed herself, mm. and then his second wife Asia Weevil killed herself and their four-year-old daughter. So right. of his two wives and his three children, only one remains. Wow. One remains. Okay. It's, diff- is it, it's dark. That's another week we'll do remains. But... Yeah, oh, stop. Okay. Okay. No. I, I was letting I was going to wait for you to do that. Between one. the pair So of he you. didn't bring out an autobiography or anything, because that would have had a, <laughs> a strange like, a title. Like, <laughs> the oven it death. wasn't me. <laughs> or something. Stop. Sorry. No, I'm. Point is <laughs> that on. he would. He was not a stranger to conflict, I suppose. No. Um, in no. love and war. In love and war. His yeah. poetry often reflects that of a predator, so a lot of his work is. Predatory animals. Yes. Um, right. Is it the fox? Off the top of my head, really famous one. Oh right, did he write? Because that, that rings a bell. He grew up um, in Yorkshire, didn't he? In the mm. in the countryside and village, and had developed quite a um, quite a I suppose a liking for wildlife. I think he was a assistant zookeeper, I believe. Or really? s- something. Yeah. And there was something else he did involving animals. So uh, he. He was very much interested in them, and so we'll get to that in a minute. I think that's quite important when it comes to looking at the poem. Yeah. And um, ex-poet laureate. And ex-poet laureate. And his father fought as a soldier as well, so mm. I'm sure he was influenced by that. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah the stories. But he did not. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, super. Right. Language, then. Um, in discussing this beforehand, we've kind of realised this poem is 
hinged a lot on similes, metaphors, and personification mm. in pretty much every stanza, isn't it? Yeah. It's throughout. Mm. Yes, it is rife with it. Not, yeah, not rifle with it. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I was like, okay. Oh, off. Um, so, um, you so, call her little, it's fine. Little. little. Oh, okay. You was waiting for a little person to say that. Um, so, um, yeah, rife uh, with language throughout the first the first answer, in fact, all three. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, uh, you talked about um, lots of the verbs straight away. Yeah. Very, very fast-paced, very... Um, it, it's a semantic field of... I well, what I've got running, stumbling, smacking, lugged, sweating, just in the first stanza. Yeah, I exhaustion. think pace and heaviness exhaustion, yeah. Um, yeah. and exhaustion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they're all the way through it. I think that's really it's, this poem puts you in the shoes of somebody who has to become a soldier in the middle of a war. So first, they weren't doing anything. Maybe they're asleep, or maybe they're just they were just thinking about something else because suddenly that adverb's setting off straight away. Mm. You're in the middle of it and you're, and you're presumably not quite ready for it. Mm. The repetition of raw here, uh, meaning yeah. something that is not ready yet, yeah. actually, you know, referring to animals actually, mm. and about meat not being ready, but raw again, he is raw because he's not, a, he's not a, an experienced soldier. He's young. Mm. He's raw seamed, like the seamed being put in together clothing and like the stitching is is not almost not ready it's it, it's not even ready to be in his in his clothes and it's yeah. hot mm-hmm. it's yeah. hot as well which you sometimes you think with things like exposure war being cold mm. here it's boiling hot mm. and he has to start running sweat heavy um and later on with the sweat sweating like molten iron from the center of his chest yeah it's uh it's it's quite exhausting to read as well like you say it's we are thrown in, we are unprepared. You know, from the title, we can gain an, a vague understanding mm. as to what it might be about. But m- would that be what it would have been like for war and um, people in war at the time as well? They would some people said it's tiring, yeah. Been, yeah, yeah, some might say it's tiring for sure. <laughs> it's not a walk in the park, as many, no, many, it's <laughs> certainly not, not like Wordsworth and the boat, you know. And the, and the prelude Leaving, on the boat, yeah. nicking a boat and lying in that yeah. for a bit. None of that. None no, of that. Fear of nature. Proper, proper comfort. <laughs> Absolute carnage of a Sorry. podcast today, because you two are just going to be silly. Apologize. I'm so sorry, I'm not, it's <laughs> not um, silly. No, what I meant by that, <laughs> what I meant by it is, was um, people in war at the time, they would have kind of been thrown into things, didn't have despite much training. the fact that, yeah, they didn't have much training, and even mm. if it was they'd been in the trenches, it might have been all of a sudden, they just have to, right, you weren't going yes. over the top boys, and they'd have to get themselves prepared in some way mentally and essentially how do you prepare for that how do you uh, no absolutely absolutely and i think these uh, th- those are words in there like patriotic tear mm. he's been he's been kind of sold this idea that he's there for f- for for his country for patriotic mm. yeah being in love for his country yeah. uh, but that tear in that first stanza actually turns into sweat yeah on, on his chest mm. so it kind of runs down from it from his face and during that time it stops being a tear stops being emotional and just becomes this kind of symbol of exhaustion mm. uh, joining up with all those other it's kind of like that any emotion is kind of it doesn't have a place here yes. the emotion must become something that can spur him on you don't have time a, like a robotic soldier isn't it and yeah. i think I mean, mm. we talked before we started recording that it's really hard to isolate language and structure for this poem because yeah. they are so closely linked. Yeah. But it, it's almost like we've got this robotic soldier running through and then we get the inner emotion. It's almost like it has to try and shut it down again, but it's mm. almost hard. And that kind of links with that, doesn't it? Like the molten iron from the centre of his chest. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a mixture of tear and sweat, both very human, yes. but iron makes him sound cold. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and he become he as you say becomes a robot during this. Mm. Um, I think we yeah we talked about the you know the the, ba- the the juxtaposition between the the man made and the and the metal with na- with nature here. You've got the bayonet in the last stanza and the green hedge, um, kind of the metal and the natural, and you've got the even the hair at the end. Um, is is natural, but it's you. It's talked about on line seventeen as moving in a threshing circle, mm. and threshing was uh, that's, that's that's farming terminology mm. that you'd find a kind of metal, um, kind of metal machinery going round mixing up mixing up seeds and crops. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so you certainly have that juxtaposition sort of making that point, I think, that, that I those think industrial people... imagery with yeah. them. Absolutely, I was, yeah. I was going, I don't know if this is an overread in any sense of it, but the contrast between the man made and the natural, it's not natural for somebody to go into war and kind of just lose all their emotions, but it's almost like you're forced to do it because if mm. you let your emotions get in the way, what, you'd be an absolute mess. And yeah. I often think that with, um, just not in the anthology, I always pronounce it wrong, is it Dolce Decorum Est? Yes. Yeah. Is that what, um, I remember bits and pieces from it, but it's, that's the one where they get gassed at the end, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And it's almost like, in that sense, emotion has no place, it leads it to danger it for does. them. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I suppose it's just like literature, but it, isn't it? But it's yeah. it's a funny it's a it's a funny idea because you say it, it, it doesn't have place. Emotion doesn't have place, but he's almost like he's got no reason of being there. That he's actually let go of all this all this stuff in that second stanza, where he's he's looking for the reason of his still run, still running. It's not just he's losing emotion; mm-hmm. he's losing all reason for being there. Which I'm sure you know mm-hmm. the the you know the captains and generals they wouldn't have wanted that. And it's, yeah. that it's. He's almost been sold a lie, I think. Yeah, this, this and character. obviously had the propaganda at the time. And like, if this yeah. is a clues for the game. On, yeah. on line 20 is that yeah. king, king honour, human dignity, dignity etc. Yeah. That word, etc., basically dismissed. saying all those things don't, yeah. don't matter. It's it all been dismissed. Anymore. It was all just a ploy to get them out there. Mm. They were mis- If this is World War One, which we can heavily presume it is, yeah, they, so. we know that was missold. We know that was. Stop it. We we know that was, um, but then again, that kind of links to exposure, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, they were a miss, not missile, but it's not what they were anticipating. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Um, yeah, Charles the Light Brigade again. It's the, yeah. they're kind of it, it's to do with people in charge, um, making decisions that aren't good for everybody else. Mm. Essentially, they are they are fodder. Uh, soldiers like this are fodder for the for for the politicians and people mm. in charge. Of the war, mm. uh, I just wanted to bring up there is a there's a film coming out called um, 1917, and it's one winning lots of awards at the moment. I don't think it's in cinemas yet, but it's all shot as one as one shot. So you, mm. it's one camera shot going mm. all the way through. I think it's edited slightly, but I, I I thought of this poem when I when I heard about it and read the reviews. It seems like it's going for exactly the kind of idea of this mm. very very claustrophobic, mm. um, sort of inescapable. Um, kind of present tense idea mm. of war that you just can't get out of it and just to really, really show you that kind of, yeah, the inescapable quality of war. So I think maybe check that out, actually, it might be quite yeah. interesting, yeah. interesting. And even just for, you know, it's really interesting, it kind of matches with this and its context of World War One. so you're technically mm. revising for this, yeah. exposure. Yeah. Um, even to an extent you'll be revising for an inspector calls because this is what they're going into, isn't it? Yeah. This is the future for a character like Eric or Gerald. Fire and blood and anguish. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Cool. The fire and the blood and the, and the anguish, yes. indeed. Can't this is what it is. Anguish. Not <laughs> the anguish. Um, <laughs> not. Et cetera. You're anguishing um, over us at the moment. <laughs> what does that mean? She's anguishing over us and You two, you're oh, having so a little it's... pun off with each other. Yeah. I'm glad you got a lot of it out of your system before I pressed record. <laughs> um... Uh, Oh, we're going. We're not going for record. Should we go for record? <laughs> yeah. Another one. Mm. Oh, well, I was going to say before we yeah, we're we going to the structure. Yeah. Yes. If Let's. we have not already. Yep. So st- structurally, what I like, I like. You know, if you look at the poem on the page, you can always tell something. I think. And here, I think we could uh, we could agree that it looks quite neat and uniform. Mm. You've got two. You've got two longer sort of stanzas um, on the on the beginning and end, and then one slightly shorter one in the middle. But it looks quite neat on the page and ordered and considered. Mm. If we actually, you know, we might say that that's a little bit like a soldier and the way they're supposed to look. Yeah. Um, they're supposed to look perfect. They're all buttons in the mm. right places. All you know, um, absolutely immaculate. However, on the inside, if you look at these lines, it. they are broken with enjambment. Mm. There's cesura dotted around the place it's so yeah. it's so chaotic and that second one is so breathless when you read it yeah it's, absolutely it's hard it's hard to read the second stanza yeah. isn't it i it feel is. it oh, i often feel i'm stumbling over mm. myself when i get to the what yeah you don't know when you, that second yeah. you can't foresee when when the pauses are going to be yeah. and i think that's what it's like for the the soldiers the they don't know what on earth coming mm. literally what on earth is coming up because there's lots of mentions of clod and furrows all this yeah. kind of again farming terminology again yeah. you might hear um and i think really that's about those soldiers supposed to be looking presentable and perfect and equipped 
but inside their minds you have so just chaos, chaos yeah. uh, due to probably most most of all the um, their raw kind of youthfulness. Mm. Yeah, I always like the way it ends when it, his terror's touchy dynamite, and that's that links yeah. with all of this. That actually, it's a, it's it's emotion, it's fear, it's all of that. That is just as fatal to him yeah. as mm. the dynamite. So if it's like that could explode at any cool. moment and yeah. be fatal and cause him to panic. What, what do you think it means by terror touches dynamite? Do you... I've always read it because the way that you've got that possessive apostrophe of his terror, mm. it belongs to that his terror is explosive. Mm. That this could mm. kill him. This mm. is th- this is dangerous to feel, have emotions. Goes into almost into that re- the idea of remains as well. Mm. That um, is it the the I oh know I'm thinking of Manhunt actually the mind behind enemy lines. There's another poem that's not in the not in there, but remains is the same. It's got this idea that it's it's trapped inside. That your, is remains. Yeah, it's remains. Dug in behind enemy Dug lines. Dug behind enemy lines. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Just showing my expert teacher knowledge there. You're so so that's, key stage four coordinator. Yeah, okay, good. I, do, I have <laughs> so many funny. poems in my brain. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in Brazil, right? Um, so yeah, I was right. Brain. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, it's that same idea that yeah, there's there's this thing that could go off. It is in Manhunt as well. I'm sure it's check out my hand as well. <laughs> but yeah, there is an idea that it's this unexploded yeah. mine. Armitage but yeah, but, but it's stuck in behind enemy lines. Is, yeah, th- this this memory is there, or this idea, now it's in his brain. And that, I think, is about... It's almost foreshadowing that post-traumatic stress disorder, terror's touchy dynamite, mm. which he's undoubtedly going to have Shell as a result shock. of this. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about we've mentioned a lot of poems it goes with mm. but the same ones are coming up again and again aren't they yeah remains charged light brigade exposure yeah. those three are coming up a lot aren't they and mm-hmm. and i think that probably is our our theme bit isn't it yeah uh, we've yeah. got down war and conflict and the effects of war and conflict remains and exposure yeah. um remains is the effect of war i mean that's probably its main I, theme i i think so i think you could talk about we were, we were talking about this again. We'd have to be quite perceptive about it, but I think you could compare this to to nature as well. I mean, you've got a lot of nature and exposure. So mm. if you're comparing, comparing it to exposure, I think it's a it's a really good one to do. But it, with exposure, obviously the 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 nature attacks the soldiers. With this, it's so you can see the effect that soldiers and war has on nature. And we didn't really haven't spoken about it, but that hair in that third stanza is pretty important that is the only other living living creature that's mentioned in this whole poem no other soldiers on his side or the other but there is a hair and that that small small yellow hair you know might be to do with don't we really laughing at yellow I, hair it's not even over I don't solitary know hair solitary hair a little bit well, it's a strand of hair not a hair I don't know I know it's a head hair like, in my head I'm picturing like yellow hair right you know, get in the shower sometimes you're like where that oh from? don't <laughs> I can't go. You know, I don't mention stuff like that because it's going to go throat. down a bad, bad route. I don't know why we recorded with you this week. You're I'm in a silly sorry. mood. You're I'm in a sorry. very silly mood. I do apologize. Trying to get in down. shower imagery. <laughs> the... Shower imagery. If we can bring it back to the showers it's of World War Two. Showered with similes, metaphors, and personification. There you go. I've linked it. Nice. Mm. Hair. H A R E. If there's any I confusion, know. I don't like know the why animal. I was thinking of that. Because <laughs> it's, 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 it's a pun. It's a pun. Uh, I think you need a time out. I think you need a time No sugar for you. Yeah. The hair is very stylistic of Hughes. He uses, as we said, in the context section, he, he uses a lot of animal in Im- imagery in his wider poem. I remember mm. reading this for the first time thinking, oh, there's Hughes. Mm. Like, th- I, I read the rest of it and was kind of lost <coughs> based on what I... Why are you laughing at me because for? Because there's Hughes. I just meant Hughes as a hair. <laughs> you picture him as a... No! Was Hughes a hair? Did a hair write this? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> As in, I read a lot of Ted Hughes at university because I did a Hughes and Plath module side yeah. by side. And I was looking for, like, I, I hadn't read something like this from him before. Mm-hmm. So I was looking for that nature metaphor. Looking for, oh, I see. I was looking for something That's very common. natural. And so, so when I got to that It's not the bit, only poem written by a rabbit. That was the <laughs> anthology. Mean. It's not That's, what I mean. Uh, no, but I like that. I like you found something of him. <coughs> there's, a little, there's a little fingerprint of Hughes in there. Yeah. And the one that you recognised. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
I do apologise, you're Nervous laugh. You know, it's my fault. Oh, I'm like sure to, there's probably one No, I'd like to point out, I'm not entirely sure Mr Grimmett really wanted to be here this no. week. Uh, I don't feel very well. I'm, d- I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart no, and the rest of my body. That's very kind of you. For what good there is in there left. Yeah. But I think, it, yeah, I think this yeah, I think is good, good thing to do. To go back to your nature, Storm on the Island... Na- um, I never said Storm on the Island, but... Yeah, you know. I think if they're going to argue this is nature compared to Storm on the Island, yeah. it's got to be perceptive, that you've got to be confident. Or ex- it can ex- yeah, no, if you do that... a thesis statement, I think, I think the beginning. Yeah, but you could do exposure, you could link, make those parallels a bit better, because you've got war as well. I think Depending I agree on the question, with you. Yeah. But um, if, if it was nature alone... Personally, I think I'd I'd really struggle to write that. Mm. Yeah, no, I I think it. You're hinging I, on I think it you could do, you? but I I don't think it. It's probably not. A, it would not lack. A, it would lack substance for an answer. And, and we were saying as well, this one actually has been on the GCSE year eleven. This one was on in twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. I think it was the first it year. It was the first one. Yeah. It was bayonet charge. How is war presented? Mm. And with one other, loads of students picked charge of the light brigade. I know mm. loads of my year elevens came out that year, and I was. Pretty pleased mm-hmm. to hear that's what they picked. Effects of conflict this year, that, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it, they was given war photographer. So that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be able to use bayonet charge. It just seems, let's face it, a little unlikely. Mm. This is, I mean, if we use this podcast again, this is in 2019. We're saying this. Mm. Yeah. It seems perhaps a little unlikely that bayonet charge would be. Used. But again, it actually links with a few. As they remains exposure charge to light brigade war and conflict. The effects of it, the reality of it. It's quite a lot. There is. I I like it. I think I think it's a great poem. I think that you, yeah, if you've got something on conflict and mm. especially the realities of conflict, then this is this is your poem. I kind of like the way it goes. Action, go 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 go, and then the second stanza is all reflection, and mm. I, I I always picture it like a film, and it's like gone into complete slow motion. It, yeah, and you're just watching it all play out. Who yeah. did the Sherlock Holmes films and the like, Lock, Stock and Two, Smoking Barrels and Snatch? I don't know, but I know the ones you mean. The new ones with Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah. it reminds me of that. That fit that way oh, of filming. Know. What's his name? He's bringing out another one now. Um, but Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie. Yeah, Guy Ritchie. He, yeah, he films. It's very, very fast, action paced, and then it slows down, and you get to hear what the, the what's going on. And stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or ev- yeah, even the um, even the narration, and it's it's almost effective like that. It is like a film. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it comes back in the but yeah. That's Super. Thank you so much, yeah. Mr. Grimm. Against your will. <sighs> yes, you're you welcome. You are now part of the Little Lang Gang. I only mildly regret doing this. Why would you regret doing I it? I like that it's only mildly, though. So yeah, that, that's, that's, right. that's, that's a, an achievement. That is an achievement to me. That is, yeah. Yeah, and we've entertained you for, the, for that nearly 23 minutes. Again, mildly, mildly. Mildly. But yeah. Mildly. No, I've, I've very much enjoyed myself. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Please you invite much. me back. Yeah. Yeah. We'll happily invite you back if if you're willing <laughs> to come back. I think I'm going to be excluded from this. <laughs> yeah, I think the scoff's not welcome next no. week. I think next week you're you are cut off. No, I can do it. Maybe she stands in the corner or just turns around or something. Yeah, that might be, that'd be good. Wonderful. Right, thanks very much. I don't know what we. Well, I don't know what our plan is next. Um, yeah, we, we'll let you know. I guess you'll see when it goes up because we haven't pre-planned which ones we're doing in order. No. It's when people are available. But thank you so much, Mr. Grimmett. Thank you. Partially, thank you, Miss Goff. And guys, <laughs> we'll hopefully see you again next time. Bye. Bye.